And so at this point, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Scott McIver, who is with the University of Toronto in Scarborough. And I have followed his work for quite a few years. Probably some of you have, have um, also relating to uh, solitary cavity nesting bees in and around the city. I was actually just re-listening to Scott's uh, interview on the Pollination Podcast. So if you don't know about the Pollination Podcast and you're a Pollination fan, you'll want to find that. Um, and Scott was one of the first of uh, participants to be interviewed on pollination, talking about his research, some of the wonderful resources they pulled together in Toronto, really kind of leading the way with uh, bee conservation there in the city. And Scott's work with green roofs and green infrastructure, looking at uh, walls and community gardens, other uh, constructed infrastructure and its effect on bees, really, really exciting research. So Scott, I'm really excited to have you with us uh, this morning and talking about those that green infrastructure, what we know about um, if it's helping wild bees. Let me stop my share. Hi, Denise. There we go. Great, thank you. Here, I'll start my video too. Okay, and I've enabled the transcription. Fantastic. Let me share my screen. And everyone can see that. Denise, you can see that okay? Yep, looks great. Fantastic. Okay, um, well, thanks everyone for uh, turning up on this uh, virtual presentation <clears throat> that I'm about to give. And I wanna just thank very quickly to Denise for inviting me to uh, speak to you about this topic that uh, is really important to me uh, and to our lab and to our city as I hope to kind of explore a little bit in this talk. Uh, my talk title today is Constructed Green Infrastructure to Support Wild Bees. And I'll talk a little bit about what green infrastructure is and what constructed green infrastructure is um, and some of the ways in which we uh, can find ways to support bees along this, as I call it, the remnant to, cre remnant to created continuum of urban green spaces that we find in cities supporting biodiversity. So again, uh, my name is Scott McIver. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Um, and uh, why don't we get started? Minimize my face here in the corner. Okay, so uh, we are a research lab, just quickly to introduce, we refer to ourselves as the Bugs Lab, Biodiversity of Urban Green Spaces. Uh, and we're really interested in biodiversity in cities uh, at the nexus of urban planning and design. And so we like to think about biodiversity conservation in cities, cities as a means of supporting biodiversity, but also how can biodiversity support us through ecosystem services that we, um, you know, um, uh, plan and uh, with intention in urban green spaces. And so, uh, as I mentioned, one way that biodiversity supports growing cities is through ecosystem services. It's something that uh, uh, many different uh, research topics have been explored over the last few decades. Um, but uh, the mechanisms by which we support biodiversity in cities, connectivity, planning green spaces, and so on, may also in an unintentionally support invasive species, which can have negative impacts. Um, we also do lots of work in community engagement, um, uh, uh, working with the public to collect data, um, conveying our research and uh, uh, finding ways to uh, enact the things that we do uh, among the public and among uh, policy and, and guidelines and things, which we'll talk about. Uh, here's one example, which I'll get into. Um, but of course, at the same time, growing cities uh, require space for people, um, habitation and circulation and all the important bits that make a city vibrant and functioning for people. And so we're really trying to connect people to nature and make uh, uh, these various, um, the various attributes of the city, um, uh, both supporting biodiversity, but compelled and, and uh, improved by biodiversity. So just a little image of uh, our lab pre-COVID. I mean, we haven't uh, had a meeting uh, with everyone in the lab uh, in recent times, but that's, that's definitely coming. So as I said, uh, one uh, important avenue of our work is um, explaining what we do and explaining why it's important to people. And so here we are just out uh, in High Park. This is a, a large uh, park in the city of Toronto, remnant oak savanna habitat. So very sandy, non-compacted soils, well draining and full of ground nesting bees. In fact, in this group here, there are uh, male uh, ground nesting bees flying all around our legs 
Um, of course, males don't sting, so nothing to be worried about, but what they're doing is waiting for a female to emerge where they can ball all around her and uh, try to reproduce with her. Um, and we also do a lot of work uh, in outreach with uh, designers and practitioners. So uh, uh, Denise mentioned that we do some work with green roofs, but we're also interested in habitat creation uh, that uh, creates opportunities for nesting substrates for bees. And we'll talk a bit about that with some of our work with cavity nesting bees. So really trying to focus on, uh, you know, uh, research that informs conservation, uh, research that can be um, uh, uh, conveyed through outreach and uh, research that inevitably leads to applied um, uh, solutions to the multifaceted and complicated problems that we face today and tomorrow in cities, including uh, biodiversity loss and the impacts of urbanization. And um, here we are, of course, we're talking about bees and pollinators. So uh, that's certainly um, what we do in the lab. Um, it, I don't need to explain this in great detail to this group, but we know that wild bees are important. Uh, we also know that wild bees are diverse with, you know, 20,000 plus species around the world. In Canada, we're up over 850 or so, and we just keep adding um, lots of different bee species spread across the country and in the U.S. as well. Um, and why are bees important? Well, again, uh, just preaching to the audience here. Of course, bees are the most effective and uh, 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 essential pollinators in, in all uh, terrestrial environments around the world. I mean, except for Antarctica for now. Um, of course, bees have a number of really cool attributes that they have evolved to be very effective at collecting pollen and nectar from their favorite flowers. And similarly, flowers have uh, you know, evolved a, a, new, a number of structures um, from floral shape and timing and nectar production and height from the ground and timing of the year and all these things that we as humans appreciate as gardeners and as those that, uh, you know, find nature compelling and beautiful. Um, but of course, we all know that um, much of that evolution of the, the, the myriad of, of color and beauty that we see uh, is to attract these uh, co-evolved mutualisms with the bees that visit them and uh, provide that pollination service uh, in exchange, of course, for food. Um, one thing to note too, of course, is that wild bees are not managed bees. So wild bees are those that are out um, and not uh, being, being managed or, or maintained by us. So one obvious example are honeybees, which are managed bees. You can see some uh, uh, large honeybee uh, colony structures here uh, on our campus. Um, again, don't need to go into too much detail here, but as social bees with the queen workers and drones, they're able to you know, consume lots of food in the environment. But of course, in environments that are um, you know, uh, reorganized into conventional agricultural systems, honeybees can be extremely valuable, for example, in this uh, almond field here. Um, but really important to note, I think, um, in the context of why wild bees matter, is some work by my colleague James Hung here that shows along the x-axis the proportion of visits by honeybees uh, to different flower species and uh, the proportion of plant species um, uh, visited uh, on the on the y-axis here and what you see here is uh, a large number of flower species out in, in, in the world um, aren't visited by honeybees at all. There's, there's lots of flowers that depend specifically on wild pollinators and wild bees specifically um, to enact reproduction. Of course, there's lots of uh, flowers that are visited almost entirely by honeybees if you look along that x-axis and that's uh, a really great um, space to conduct those kinds of research projects linking the impacts of honeybees to wild bees. And so wild bees are important for that reason, I said, right? There's lots of flowers out there that are visited only by wild bees. And there's tens of thousands of wild bees on the planet and many more we don't know about yet. Um, so if you look at this um, uh, diagram here, this interaction network, if on the green side, we have bees and on the orange side, we have flowers in any one environment, including urban environments, these networks actually tell us quite a bit, right? They tell us about the, 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 the species that are present in the uh, environment, right? It tells us about which flowers different bees are visiting, which flowers have multiple types of visitors, which ones are visited by only one type of bee. Um, and all of these network 
uh, linkages between the green and the orange side here um, tell us a bit about the stability and perhaps even the quality of the environment uh, that we're studying. So these kinds of networks um, are an important way that we assess uh, habitat change with urbanization by looking at the changes in these linkages. Um, of course, wild bees uh, have uh, innumerable different uh, ecological strategies and behaviors. It's really hard to uh, narrow some of those down, but one that we often uh, refer to are those that nest in the ground and those that nest above it. And in most environments from Ohio to Toronto, uh, well, to Ontario, um, about three quarters or so of bee species nest in the ground. And so you can imagine that in a city, this is a group that uh, is potentially under great peril, right? We pave, we compact, we till and we turn soil over, and this can have great impacts to the nesting opportunities for bees. Of course, we wanna support flowers, but the nesting space is really critical as well, especially when you consider the diversity of bees that we might even find in a city um, where all of those ground nesting bees have different um, architectures underground. And there's some really amazing research that's been done over the decades um, looking at this nest architecture. And you can imagine that um, you know, in the city, what we see with respect to urbanization is obvious, but we never get to see what's below ground. And this, of course, is a really open question in this study of urban uh, bee conservation. Um, and the rest of the bees, uh, you know, give or take, I'm, I'm, I'm really reducing this down a bit here, but um, about a quarter of them are those that nest above the ground, either um, actually excavating a nest in a plant stem or renting the nest, right? Finding a hole that already exists. So a common way that bees do this is look for uh, beetle board holes out of wood and decaying logs and so on. But of course, in cities, uh, we construct a great deal of you know, uh, uh, infrastructure, buildings and so forth, and nail holes and, and holes in brick and mortar and so forth can also serve as habitat for some species. Um, why are bees important? Of course, also uh, the, they're important pollinators of food crops, right? So uh, uh, many conventional agricultural systems supply our breakfasts, our lunches and dinners and so on. Um, but in a city, food security is of increasing importance and connecting people to nature can uh, be uh, enacted through uh, community gardening, allotment gardening and food growing. Especially in a city like Toronto, one of the most culturally diverse regions in all of North America, um, there's a great deal of uh, interest in growing culturally appropriate foods. And we know very little about the pollination systems of some of these foods uh, in Toronto and in Canada. And so uh, uh, that aside, um, in general, we also know that wild bees are important to stay, you know, maintain and sustain uh, various uh, pollination systems in orchards and uh, other crop systems. So I, we can look at this and, and see very clearly the most nutritious and colorful uh, items on the plate are, are lacking in the breakfast without bee pollination. Funny enough and interestingly, even the milk, right? So in Ontario, uh, um, a great deal of uh, dairy cattle are fed alfalfa and alfalfa is a pollinator dependent crop. So uh, pollination for food aside, diversity in the pollinators present in an environment plays a critical role in the food produced as well. And all this is showing here with tomatoes and also with pumpkins is that you get a greater yield of the crop or the quality of the crop improves when more different bee types are present. Take for example, a, a pumpkin um, the, you know, or, or, or a squash, these flowers are open for a very short period of time. And uh, uh, by having a diverse pollinator community within, a within this particular area, you can uh, be hopeful that many different kinds of bee species are visiting that single flower. So if each one of these dots is a single flower and uh, uh, it representing seed set or, or quality, um, what this is saying is that more different kinds of bees visiting that single flower will lead to a more effective pollination service. So if you had 10 visitors to a single flower, you wouldn't want all of those visitors to be honeybees, for example. You'd want each of those visitors in a perfect world 
to be of a different species. And again, uh, this is all very important because uh, wild bees uh, uh, include threatened species, right? So a recent paper just came out uh, this past year um, showing that globally 25% of wild bee species haven't been recorded since the 1990s. And um, some common groups have declined and you know, other uh, groups have uh, declined precipitously much, much more. So what we're seeing is you know, uncommon species becoming rare, rare species becoming locally extinct. And we have examples of this in Toronto and the region. Uh, my good colleague, Sheila Kola has been working on the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, I do believe it might be present still in, in Ohio and some of the, uh, the US states, but certainly in Ontario, we haven't seen it in quite some time. And uh, you know, urbanization, agriculture, and uh, some of the synergistic impacts of those processes um, are presumed to have uh, led to the decline of this uh, uh, and extirpation of this bee in, in my, where I live. Um, and especially with bumblebees, because they're so uh, cute and large and identifiable, um, uh, we're, we have very robust data on their presence and occurrence. And so we know that uh, one of the next bumblebees that we are expecting to see uh, leave our region is uh, Bombus tricola. And so there's a lot of work going into this one now. Okay. Um, let's narrow in on Toronto here. So this is uh, Toronto where uh, I live and uh, we are one of the largest cities by population size in uh, North and Central America. Um, and interestingly, uh, in North America, we're also one of the greenest cities uh, and uh, upwards of 28% green space is captured uh, uh, through, you can kind of see uh, to the south of the city is Lake Ontario. To the north is the green belt, which is uh, uh, land that's conserved from development that's larger than the province of Prince Edward Island. So it's quite large, although under increasing threat. Um, and you can see uh, uh, transects going from uh, north to south. These are our ravines, um, which have been kept intact since the 1950s. We had a massive hurricane that led to large scale flooding and planning and policy that conserved these areas uh, all through time. And much of it has remained. And up near U University of Toronto Scarborough is to the northeast, uh, right to the kind of, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but where this large green space is up here. And this is actually where Canada's first urban national park is located. This is the Rouge uh, National Urban Park. And uh, this is an initiative happening across the country, trying to bring uh, conservation at a national park level uh, to people who live in cities because uh, it's easier for them to access. So uh, of course with bee declines and a lot of interest in bees for pollination services and, and, and native plants and so forth, um, there's been a, a ton of work in the city of Toronto over the last uh, few decades studying wild bees, um, uh, including finding new species to science right in the downtown core uh, by my colleague, Jason Gibbs, uh, finding Lassioglossum fbaltum which it turned up actually is a kind of a cryptic bee and found uh, much further than uh, this, the city center, that's for sure. And we, we've seen a great growth in the number of artists and other community members outside of traditional academic silos, engaging with bees and pollination, their importance, their diversity, and uh, you know, finding ways to connect people to these really cool and interesting native species. So this is a colleague, Nick, uh, who does a lot of murals. And this is just one of several murals across the city. Um, this one actually showing Canada's, or sorry, Toronto's official bee species, which I'll reference in just one second. So the city of Toronto, we're doing quite a lot. And um, we, we have a few other uh, resources that we've been pr producing uh, for the public. This is a book that's free to the public, available in uh, Toronto libraries as a hard copy, but also digitally. Uh, it's called the Bees of Toronto, and in it we have a checklist of all the bees historically of the region. We're currently trying to work on that as an update, but uh, upwards of 360 species uh, have been recorded from museum records and so forth from the region. In this book, too, we identify areas for bee watching, where to find large aggregations of ground nesting bees, for example, what to look for, what to uh, observe through the seasons, how to maintain your yard for bees, introducing you to artists in Toronto that use bees in their work, uh, and of course, a history of beekeeping and bee research across our universities. 
Um, in 2019, we had, uh, and, and we have been working with the city of Toronto uh, on a number of things, guidelines and uh, policy and such uh, for years, but I, I wanna specifically mention this one product, which uh, is referred to as a Toronto Pollinator Protection Strategy. Uh, this outlines uh, strategies that are uh, intended to be put in place within the municipality, like in various offices, uh, but also to promote wild and native bees uh, among the public, so giving them a number of strategies. This was passed uh, unanimously by City Council uh, back in 2019 in May. And on the cover of this, you can see uh, is our Toronto's official bee species, uh, Agapestemon virescens, uh, the bicolored Agapestemon. Uh, it's a very common bee in our, in our city, uh, often a nesting in, in uh, people's lawns. Um, uh, and uh, we chose this as Toronto's official bee because uh, it's a fair, fairly docile bee and sisters or, or close relatives will nest in, uh, uh, you know, nearby and, you know, watch each other's nests for, for parasites or, you know, even enter each other's nests and so on. And we took that as an opportunity to convey, you know, Toronto, which is a city of neighborhoods, this is a very neighborly bee. <laughs> Um, and uh, this has been really productive for us because in, in act, getting the pollinator protection strategy enacted, it kickstarted a program called Pollinate TO, which is administered by the city, um, which is a grant program that's offered every year. And it offers uh, community groups and organizations $5,000 to create a pollinator garden. And our lab works with the city of Toronto and others to um, using research uh, from our work in the city, which I hope to go into in a minute, um, to uh, perpetually modify and adapt the uh, granting program so that uh, we are ensuring the most effective approaches are being used. Okay, so uh, in Toronto, like many cities across the world, uh, we're grappling with this idea that uh, urban urbanization um, and anthropogenic change has a negative impact on biodiversity. And I think we can all agree, and there are many, many studies that have shown the impacts of urbanization on, on wildlife and plant life, you know, cities as hotspots for invaders, you know, sensitive species, species being unable to be supported in cities, um, pavement, uh, pollution, um, urban heat island effect, and so on. There are many reasons uh, that are, are very clear in the literature and in folks work that show that cities are a stressful environment for many species. So one hypothesis uh, for bees, of course, is that cities are a stressor and we see uh, environmental filtering of species as a result of the changes to the, the landscape in which they, they, they survive. Um, it has been proposed though, that for some species, uh, some taxonomic groups, uh, including bees, and, and there are other others as well, which we won't go into today, that cities could actually be a refuge. So the, um, you know, the mosaic of urban habitats, the heterogeneity uh, presented um, uh, by public and private space, um, gardening and, and aesthetic appreciation for nature, e even in the dense urban core could promote uh, habitat opportunities for some species, especially um, when cities are surrounded by agricultural landscapes that are sometimes monotypic or uh, having, uh, you know, high pesticide or herbicide usage and other usages and so on. In Toronto, like all cities in Ontario, uh, cosmetic herbicides and pesticides are, are not uh, permitted. Um, and, you know, when we start to look, we start to see some weird stuff, right? So with respect to bees, which again is the focus of this talk, um, in cities, we start to see them doing some, what we presume erroneous activities or maybe adaptive activities. So here we have leaf cutter bees at the top using plastic shopping bags to make nests, right? And uh, the bees emerged from that nest. And on the lower uh, panel here, we have a, resin bee, a native species of, of resin bee, Megachile campanula, that typically collects pine sap. Here we found it using uh, window caulking material. And I, at first I thought it was gum and I did try it when I opened the nest, but I assure you it was not gum. Uh, and it, I assure you from the chemical testing that it was in fact uh, window caulking. So these strange behaviors that bees are exhibiting in an urban environment. I mean, here's another image uh, of Osmia lignaria, a native uh, mason bee nesting in a metal tire rim. 
And another example uh, of a leaf cutter bee nesting in a metal armchair that you typically find in your backyard. Now, these are the same kind of chairs that people often bring to the beach and they leave them in the sun and then suddenly your arm is burning because it touched the hot metal. Does this bee know that it's going to get hot in August when uh, its brood cells are feeding uh, in, in this uh, you know, tubular nesting opportunity? Or, or uh, of course, I assume it wouldn't, but these kind of erroneous aberrant behaviors that may or may not be indicative of adaptation to this novel environment are really quirky and uh, we find very interesting in the lab uh, in the context of cities being a refuge, right? Some of the things we do might support species that uh, uh, in a novel way. Now, you know, there are some other important uh, 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 items from remnant nat restored natural environments that we have been able to uh, glean and take those approaches in cities. An obvious one is restoration, right? So increasing plant richness or diversity um, is a strategy that can support more different kinds of bees, more different kinds of connections, and that's stability that we were uh, discussing uh, several minutes ago. So this is just uh, some work from one of the master students in my lab, Cicely Irwin, uh, who's looking at restoration projects under electrical hydro corridors in Toronto. And what you can see is uh, a number of different restoration techniques are taken. And uh, those that are um, older restorations that have more mature and diverse plant communities, we see more of these types of connections, uh, even in the city center. And uh, this kind of brings me to the kind of second half of, of my talk, and that's really starting to think about uh, the urban green spaces that are present in cities and uh, how different they can be, right? Um, there's a myriad of different urban green space types going from, you know, remnant green spaces that, um, you know, have been uh, uh, put under conservation, um, uh, restrictions or, or, or policy that ensures there's no development there. I mentioned the ravines. Um, moving into areas that uh, um, are greened, but uh, are certainly deserving of restoration. You know, anthropogenic impacts in cities uh, cause uh, an impact, a, a loss of habitat. But we all know, and uh, you know, what an exciting thing about this kind of work is that humans can be have a positive impact too we can restore these areas and uh, increase the habitat value. So we have remnant, restored, and uh, finally we have uh, urban green spaces that are wholly created, right? So uh, they are uh, habitat where habitat would not be otherwise in the urban center. So uh, we in the lab have focused quite a lot on green roofs uh, and for a number of reasons, which I won't go into too much today, but. Uh, the city of Toronto uh, has a green earth bylaw, a construction standard, um, an incentive program, and it's led to over 700 green roofs in the city today, um, which presents a really cool opportunity to look at, you know, aspects of two and three dimensional urbanization, uh, connectivity, and simply the role of this like really novel and interesting habitat that is wholly designed. Um, and so you can see that uh, across this continuum, of urban green spaces, um, we uh, have uh, variation within and across urban green space types. And again, uh, thinking about cities as a refuge and the heterogeneity, the mosaic-like element that uh, cities may provide, this is really indicative of this range. And what we do know is that um, more different kinds of habitat presents more different kinds of niches and this can create more opportunities for different species that are under less competition or, or there's more complementarity there. So I mentioned urban green spaces, but I, I will for the rest of this talk uh, have urban green spaces and green infrastructure used just simply as synonyms of each other. Uh, green infrastructure in, in, in the context that we study is really just natural features um, you know, vegetated features such as remnant habitats, restored green spaces um, that are within or around urban developments and they support ecological services. So very broad, 
Um, and you can see from this image that in a, in, a, in a slice of the city that there are a myriad of different types all within walking distance of one another. Um, I mentioned remnant habitats and I also mentioned the Rouge National Urban Park. This would be an example of a remnant habitat, one that is uh, protected from urban development and supports uh, species often more unique and specialized species. We do definitely find a few genera of bee in uh, Rouge Park that we don't really find anywhere else in the city. And we also have these restored uh, green spaces as well. As I mentioned, the hydro corridor, the Meadowway. This is a project we are working on to restore different sections uh, with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. It's a really cool project. Um, the Meadowway is actually, again, an electrical hydro corridor that runs from the center of Toronto all the way, for those of you that know your Canadian geography, to Gatineau, Quebec. It's pretty far. And the section that we refer to as the Meadowway is that which connects the downtown core of the city all the way to the Rouge National Urban Park. So th there's linear bike corridors and great circulation that if you are somebody who can uh, ride a bike for two and a half hours, you can work your way all the way across uh, the Eastern region of the city. And finally, and perhaps uh, important for this talk is uh, constructed green infrastructure. So this is kind of nested within green infrastructure. It's a suite of type of urban green space. And these are engineered features that have natural elements. And so really it's, again, as I said, creating habitat where habitat would not be um, due to the urban condition, right? So here there's a few examples from a recent little book chapter. Um, and uh, the, the image was produced by a former student, Vicky. And you can see here, we've got green roofs and uh, green walls and uh, street tree parapets and bioswales. These are all great examples of engineered uh, or constructed green infrastructure. Um, and uh, really just to hit that home, constructed green infrastructure is, is uh, where traditional protection of remnant habitat or restoration are limited, right? So we're creating green space. And this is uh, actually kind of exciting. It's one of the things that got me really interested in landscape architecture and urban planning is uh, having these, these you know, spaces that, uh, I mean, often are designed to shed water Right, thinking of streetscapes or or building rooftops, uh, we're actually flipping that narrative. Right, we're trying to capture the water, support uh, uh, the plant community that absorbs the water, emits it as evapotranspiration. Uh, that water can be uh, siphoned into cisterns that are used for other purposes, and uh, one of the outcomes is. Uh, vegetation and, and substrates. And uh, therein is the opportunity to create more biodiversity. So this is at our Native Child and Family Service Center, right in the downtown core of Toronto, right at Youngin College, if anybody knows the city. And you can see here that we actually have, um, this is a, uh, there's a Three Sisters Garden and a sumac grove and a variety of other uh, uh, culturally appropriate and uh, indigenous uh, led design around uh, uh, plantings from, uh, from Ontario. As a it's a really cool site. So as I said, uh, water capture, uh, water storage, I mean, there's a number of other reasons why constructed green infrastructure is valuable over and above conventional infrastructure, the paved uh, streetscape or the um, asphalted roof, right? Um, green infrastructure is going to support all of these items here and I won't, I won't describe them, uh, today, because of course we're focusing on this last point here, urban biodiversity. Um, and we have done some work uh, in terms of uh, uh, taking a more of a meta-analysis approach. This is with our postdoc, Alex Filizola, um, where we looked at green infrastructure all in, in, in the literature in cities all over the world. And we compared the biodiversity benefits of green infrastructure to conventional gray infrastructure, right? So comparing a green wall to a bare wall or comparing a green roof to a bare roof and so on. And what you can see, um, if you go all the way to the bottom here, that little diamond shape is on the left side of the dotted line. And again, without going into uh, how this uh, was actually uh, uh, created, uh, this meta-analysis, I'll just say that if it's found on the left side where the green infrastructure um, uh, item is found, what that means is that green infrastructure supports biodiversity more than conventional infrastructure. 
great. That's what we would hope that, you know, putting substrate in plants would support biodiversity more than, um, uh, you know, a bare wall. Um, however, when we look at compare studies that compare constructed green infrastructure to the natural area analog, right? And you can see what those analogs look like along the side here, uh, natural uh, versus retention pond, uh, uh, roadside versus forest and so forth. We do find that in general, natural features support biodiversity better than constructed green infrastructure. And again, that makes sense. Thinking about substrate depths, uh, age, and uh, all the other uh, important features of remnant or restored areas in the cities uh, compared to constructed green infrastructure. So there certainly is a continuum of uh, biodiversity benefits. Um, and so, so again, green infrastructure is where we do most of our work. And you can see here that in this book chapter with my colleague, Kelly Kasich, um, um, we looked at different drivers of, uh, uh, you know, uh, from, from abiotic to biotic factors that might influence the uh, utility of green roofs in particular for biodiversity. And you can see a number of factors are listed here. Um, uh, you know, the ones that I'm going to focus on today and the ones that we've been looking at is uh, the vegetation. So the types of flowers, the amount of those flowers that are used in the particular design. And second, the connectivity of those uh, environments, right? So what's the surrounding land use? Is it in a denser urban core? Is it surrounded by large buildings? And the height, right? So green roofs are vertically isolated from ground level. And if you are a, 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 a taxonomic group with low mobility, a green roof may not serve you in the city. And so conveying that uh, green roofs have biodiversity benefits for a wide range of species is, is simply not true. Um, and, uh, animals need to get there. And so height will have an impact. Uh, so we're gonna talk about those two items uh, moving forward. I will say quickly that uh, we have really started to focus on temperature and how uh, extreme uh, temperature events, extreme warming events that we find in cities uh, uh, as a result of uh, climate change and the urban heat island effect interacting uh, is something we're really interested in moving forward with how it affects bee behavior and other things. But I, I left that off today. In fact, all, most of the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about um, uh, some of the studies that we have completed, but actually several things that we've never presented before and are still in prep. Um, so one of those is some work by uh, our undergraduates, Shannon Underwood. And what she was able to do is study bee communities uh, and flies and wasps. So I'm just gonna show you the bees and uh, all of them together here as pollinators um, on roofs of different heights and of different blooming periods. So what we found is uh, when she went out and surveyed over a year weekly from uh, uh, I believe eight different sites, um, what she found was that bee visitation declined with roof height. You can see the negative trend line here. Um, and, uh, but what she did find is that it increased with flower species richness. So often on these green roofs, and these are very shallow, um, rocky substrates that support very few different kinds of plant species. The blue um, coloration here on uh, the graphic to the right, uh, shows the bloom display or the density of blooms of sedum, which is a succulent plant, not native to North America, the species that are used on green roofs. And uh, you can see that uh, the pollinator visits track the bloom display, the floral display. Um, the teal color is a second species that we planted in Rudbeckia herta which again is a, uh, is a plant that can survive in pretty rough and tough environments, it's native species. And what we found is uh, an increase in particular among bees in uh, sites that included that rubecchia. So um, by interplanting different kinds of species, in, and even in this case, going against the grain, so to speak, because uh, the green earth industry really focuses their projects on these sedum succulent plants that bloom in the blue period, as you see, uh, by intermixing different species, we can greatly increase the value of uh, green roofs in particular, 
um, uh, for, for pollinators. So uh, what we've been able to show with this work and some of the other work that uh, I'll show you in a sec uh, and, and promote to the city is that we should be focusing habitat creation on green roofs for those that are at low to medium rise uh, sizes. So not high rises, we're, we're even putting green roofs uh, you know, 50, 60, 70 stories up uh, because it's, it's required by law. Now that may not be so suitable for habitat value. And with our incentive program, could we possibly incentivize uh, roofs that are lower to the ground um, at a, incentivize them at a higher rate so that we can get more habitat value out of those projects. Um, we've done some also some work looking at bee nesting activity on uh, green roofs. And we found again, that uh, the amount of bees that colonize uh, green roofs declines with building height as well. And again, um, bees, of course, they will visit flowers at the tips of trees. So it's not unreal to think that a bee may go up, right? Um, uh, even 10, 20, 30 odd meters. We have found bumblebees foraging 26 stories up. Uh, and so there is some, uh, certainly it, it's not out of the realm of possibility that bees would uh, seek out floral resources higher, but nesting resources seems a bit different. And so there's still quite a lot of work that is needed here to look at um, the uh, bee traits and characteristics that uh, uh, might be indicative of the kinds of bees that would be beneficiaries of green roofs. Um, and uh, I mentioned the nesting activity and we've talked about cavity nesting bees briefly and that is a focus of our research in our lab. These are uh, that native resin bee, uh, three females right here in this image, uh, Mega Kylie Campanula, all constructing nests of pine sap right now. And uh, I mean, uh, as many of you know that uh, wild solitary bees, every female is her own queen. She makes her own nests, uh, lays her own eggs, collects her own food. And so these bee hotels can be quite useful for uh, understanding the ecology and diversity of cavity nesting bees, not just with a net and identifying what flower they went to, but a myriad of other information, including uh, nest size and reproductive fitness, parasites, nesting material, and the food that they collect as well. So these have been really useful for us uh, over the years. Um, this is just uh, from a previous project. We've been setting these up uh, in from 2011 to 2013 um, across the city. And then we've been repeating this work with my uh, student Madison Marshall uh, from 2018 to 2020. So those data are forthcoming. And this is just some uh, uh, images of the city of Toronto and where we've set up nest boxes or bee hotels over time. And uh, the graphic on the right shows the amount of impervious surface and uh, the species richness that we found in uh, the, the bee hotels um, at each of those sites. So it's pretty scattered. And in general, we don't find strong relationships with urbanization with cavity nesting bees. Again, these bees nest in nail holes and brick and mortar and might be finding refuge in our gardens and plant stems and so on, maybe less affected than ground nesting bees. And that, that work is still yet to be done. Um, I will say quickly too, that these uh, maps were produced by uh, our PhD student Garland Shea, uh, whose work I will show you in a minute. Um, <laughs> this is from that 2011 to 2013 uh, data set. We do see that it, across different types of uh, green infrastructure, um, that there wasn't a lot of difference in abundance uh, because even on rooftops, there were some non-native bee species that did particularly well. Um, but we do find that species richness declines with uh, constructed green infrastructure type, right? So uh, there is variation uh, with different types of green infrastructure and the bee communities that visit them. We also found that, um, especially with the bee hotel research that non-native species are increasingly overrepresented. And this could be uh, because Mega Kali Ritzadata, Osmia Serialesis, and a few others are very um, gregarious and can nest in more um, dense uh, nesting arrangements that we find in bee hotels. Uh, it could be the materials that we use in bee hotels that are less attractive to native bees. So it could be the nest box itself, or it could be the landscape. We know that cities are generally overrepresented by non-native plant species. 
And uh, it could be the case that uh, non-native bee species also find a home in cities um, and in such a way that's just that much better than native species. So more different kinds of sampling methods are needed. But I will say that even in Toronto, where there are 360 odd species of bee, um, the vast majority of them are native species. That's a, such an interesting quirk I find about urban environments is uh, the, the plant assemblages can be quite uh, non-native and even invasive. Whereas many bee species we find in cities um, more often than not are native species. Um, however, uh, we have had some issues with this, uh, in particular with the um, uh, commercial growing of uh, uh, bee communities through bee hotels and large insect hotels, and then selling those uh, sell the, the bees um, across state lines and possibly even across um, international boundaries, right? So from US to Canada, from Europe to Canada and so forth. Um, it doesn't take much work to find number of producers online, uh, Etsy to eBay and so forth that are selling cavity nesting bees to help you create biodiversity in your backyard. Don't do this, um, create habitat and really try not to introduce bees by simply buying them online. Um, there's a lot of unknown consequences that we're just starting to understand. It's very hard to track this. However, I will say that in Toronto, um, a bee that has become invasive and quite problematic through the US, we've now learned in the past uh, few years that it has arrived in Canada and our lab was uh, among the first to find these bees in particular in the city and even in bee hotels. So we want to avoid uh, moving these bees around despite the fact that it looks like this one has made it. Um, so a few more, few more things I wanted to talk a bit about uh, before we wrap up. Um, Garland Sha and uh, Nick Sukan, two PhD students in lab, were uh, very uh, important uh, uh, researchers on this project where we looked at the um, bee species that we find in the bee hotels across the urban environment. And you can see to the left that there is a, uh, at 250 meter spatial scale, there's a strong negative correlation across our sites with impervious surface and tree cover. So where there's more impervious surface, there's less tree cover and vice versa. And what we find is when we look at the traits of the bee species that we find in nest boxes, we actually find interesting patterns where uh, bees based on their traits are being sorted through the urban environment. So bees like Hylaeus, uh, the small mast bees that secrete their own nesting material, they don't have to collect any nesting material, Right, so their grocery list is much shorter. They're able to persist in the urban environment better than some other bee species. For example, larger leaf cutter bees that may have one or two or three different kinds of materials that they need to collect to make their nest. We also see exotic or non-native bees, exotic bees being overrepresented in more urban areas and uh, native bee species. Um, being more represented in, in more natural areas. So a lot of really cool patterns in here. I will say with one caveat that wasps are included in this figure, but I left, left them out of the discussion for now, but happy to talk more. You can see uh, some of the diet stuff being spiders and things like that. Um, we have uh, related, of course, as I said, leaf cutter bees generally need, need to be around more different sources of, of green space from that last figure. And it's true, right? Leafcutter bees, they uh, of course are pollinating flowers that we plant in our gardens and on our greeners and so on, but their nesting requirements may not be served correctly in the kinds of green infrastructure that we create in the city. Um, here on the left, you see lots of different leaf cuts in all different kinds of plants. And what we did a few years ago is uh, take the leaf material from the nests of leafcutter bees and uh, use DNA barcoding to identify those uh, flowering plant species. And it was quite eye-opening to see the diversity of kinds of plants that leafcutter bees are willing to collect, but it still um, showed to us that a lot of the plants that we use, that are used by leafcutter bees to make their nests are not those being planted in our pollinator gardens, or in our green infrastructure projects. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done to understand the nesting material requirements of bees in our cities. And um, 
uh, I'm veering to the end here, and I, again, I'm kind of showing a whole bunch of different stuff because we're we're a big lab and we're working on a number of different avenues uh, around bee diversity in the city. Um, one thing that's really troubled us with the literature um, when implementing uh, pollinator gardens or green infrastructure and linking the effect of urbanization is urbanization is always measured in two dimensions. It's done by aerial imaging, uh, where we collect the amount of building footprint and road footprint and so on. Um, when in fact, we know that cities are three dimensional, right? And there's uh, building footprints that, uh, you know, can create massive barriers and uh, uh, for, for foraging bees, for bees nesting and so on. And so what we have been working on is uh, collecting LIDAR data from our city. And we've been actu actually been able to map all the building volumes and all the tree volumes for the city of Toronto. And then identify um, areas in the city where there's low 2D urbanization and high 3D urbanization, like an area of high, lots of condos, or areas with low to, or low 3D urbanization and high 2D urbanization, so maybe like industrial parks. And these are different, but using a two-dimensional metric, that wouldn't be captured. And so what we've looked at is building volume, building elevation, uh, the number of mid to high rise buildings and building shape index and look at the relationships with uh, two dimensional urbanization. And you can see it's not a linear relationship here um, uh, from these four graphics on the on the uh, right here. And in fact, when we take that cavity nesting B data set, uh, I mentioned earlier on that we didn't find any relationship with urbanization. <laughs> But when we look at three-dimensional urbanization, we do find a negative relationship for bee diversity with building volume. And uh, you know, it is, as I said, somewhat intuitive to think that bees would be impacted by complex building arrangements. And so next up, we're really interested in the composition and configuration of buildings to look at those impacts on pollinators where we find them and pollination services. So just to kind of wrap up, um, constructed green infrastructure, it works. We find bees uh, on green roofs, in our street trees, in our urban parks, and in our community gardens, um, but absolutely more work is needed as always, right? Um, one element that we have been talking a lot about in Toronto is areas of conflict between human needs and biodiversity goals. So sometimes things like decaying wood may not be that attractive to some people, um, but this really promotes nesting opportunities for bees. Um, mowing, right? We, we've seen a lot of discussion around mowing in the last few years across North America, the, the regimes of mowing and, and when and how to do it. And this really does need to be effectively uh, understood uh, in our, our remnant to restored to created continuum of urban green spaces. And lastly, um, uh, more planning needed to connect green infrastructure, co to connect the constructed green infrastructure with the remnant restored corridors, uh, understanding how connectivity can serve as an opportunity for biodiversity, but in ways that do not uh, increase or enhance invasion. But this is a very interesting uh, dichotomy to explore as well. And um, also more precision in the resources in understanding the resources available. So I mentioned nesting material, you know, that's a whole other story, but one other way that we've been looking at this is using drones and machine learning. So we've uh, been able to train, uh, uh, use, collect data sets by flying drones over areas within our uh, remnant and restored habitat types in Toronto and identify flowers and build training data sets so that we can fly a drone over an area that's 20 meters by 20 meters or 50 meters by 50 meters and capture all the available flowering uh, species and their abundances. Um, of course, in a dense urban center where there's lots of private land, this will be a little bit harder, but um, working out these mechanisms and the models that we use to, to, to run these simulations um, now will uh, serve us when inevitably there are more opportunities to fly uh, drones uh, on green roofs or in people's backyards and so on to try to capture these data. Of course, this is very time consuming normally as people going out as into subsets of plots and trying to extrapolate much larger in terms of the habitat quality or floor resources available. Okay, so the remnant to created habitat continuum in cities, you know, it includes green infrastructure to constructed green infrastructure, 
And um, what we really need to be focusing on is actions that support the species of concern, not just common non-native species. When we put a bee hotel out, are we just supporting species that don't need more help, so to speak? More flowers, right? All everywhere, all the time. That's certainly um, something we've learned through decades of restoration of natural agricultural areas. Bringing that into the city is critical and having the expertise to maintain those environments is critical. Um, and also, of course, needing to understand the role of nesting material and nesting locations uh, in our urban green spaces and even integrated into constructed green infrastructure in ways so that we're not promoting what we call bee washing, which is similar to green washing, but it's, uh, you know, conveying the uh, 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 habitat creation or opportunities that one is uh, doing to support bees, inevitably not doing that correctly. Um, the surrounding landscape matters, right? So uh, remnant habitats are going to be better than restored and better than created when it comes to uh, supporting more different kinds of bee species. And uh, this element of the three dimension, um, which is in fact almost completely ignored and for a lot of reasons, we, the data is not easily available in a lot of places, um, will have an impact on, on uh, bees and pollination services. And this needs to be uh, considered more carefully. And really it's just, it's easier, it's easy to go forward, right? It's easy to uh, destroy restored habitat and create a green roof and say, oh, well, we still have that amount of green space, but it's a lot harder to go backwards, right? So constructed green infrastructure is not an argument for the destruction of remnant habitat or green spaces where restoration is possible. So we really need to be thinking critically about conserving our green spaces in cities and living you know, in harmony. And we've been trying to do that again uh, through uh, our Toronto Ravine strategy, which supports our ravines, uh, the Toronto Green Standard, which is a, a very uh, a progressive and uh, well looked at uh, around the world sustainability uh, requirement guidelines for development in Toronto. And I mentioned our Green Earth Bylaw too, that's uh, been very successful. So just to end, uh, Jane Jacobs, who's been a huge uh, you know, influence on, on my work and my life, uh, she moved to Toronto in the late 60s um, uh, and is an important urbanist for a whole bunch of reasons, we can talk about that later. But you know, ordinary people are capable of wonderful things without even knowing they're doing wonderful things. And I think that's a really important message in an era of you know, extreme eco anxiety and uh, misunderstanding of what we as individual people can do to, su to support nature and the beauty that we appreciate. And uh, I'm not gonna go through this uh, be for lack of time, but my great colleague, Myla Aronson wrote a paper a few years ago on environmental filtering in cities and talking about how all of these different urbanization processes impact um, uh, uh, biodiversity. However, this human facilitation factor, people planting flowers, right? Gardening, taking time, observing the bees around them and talking about it with their friends can have a really important positive impact for, for bees and pollination. And so I encourage you all to think uh, globally, but also individually what, what we can do and not be, um, you know, shrouded or affected by this eco-anxiety that we all are experiencing today. So here's all the references I used. And uh, if you are looking for any of these papers, please contact me. I'm happy to share them with you. And I just have some acknowledgements, a number of uh, participants in the citizen science work, uh, park staff and managers of buildings allowing me getting up on their rooftops. Um, my PhD supervisor way long ago now, Lawrence Packer, an amazing mentor, uh, and uh, a number of students that have contributed to the work uh, in our lab. And um, I just wanna say thanks so much for listening and uh, I'll now take questions if there are any. Thank you so much. All right. Great, Scott. Thank you so much. So many great ideas and um, projects you're working on. I wonder how you can juggle all that, um, a lot of different expertise that must come together in your lab too, to do all that work. So really exciting. I loved you talking about the uh, bee watching areas in Toronto, and then you uh, you blew my mind with the bee washing concept. So uh, very, uh, very interesting. And also the tree volume. I thought that was great. Um, so folks, we are on the hour. If you need to hop out, um, I know Scott would appreciate a thank you in the chat box, but we're going to go ahead with um, some questions here and uh, we will have those posted with the recording. Got lots of good questions. Um, and so, you know, kind of all this week, we've talked a little bit about the honeybee versus wild bee kind of dynamic and uh, just wondered your input. Um, do you think the honeybee is becoming a threat to native bees? 
Um, I think that, uh, you know, honeybees have been kept for a very long time in uh, North America. And uh, it is certainly possible that there is like a bit of an invasion lag, so to speak, right? When there's a critical mass of uh, hives within a particular region, um, especially those that are sensitive. Um, absolutely. Um, not only from competition for floral resources, which may not be as big of an issue in a city where there's lots of floral resources, um, but some of the more interesting work we've seen with respect to pathogen transmission and honeybees as vectors. So um, I think it's something that is deserving of a lot more in, uh, uh, understanding. But what I will say is some of the strongest advocates for wild bee conservation are beekeepers. And so I think it's more about working together and understanding densities, uh, best practices, and an understanding that we need both uh, in this conventional agricultural landscape that we all coexist in. So I think that there's like all things that inspire me about this research on, on pollination and bees is there's a lot of open questions and there's a lot to be understood. But I do think that uh, yes, honeybees do have a, uh, uh, an impact on wild bees, just like many non-native and invasive species do. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to take an item off my um, to-do list. I got an email just this morning um, um, among more that I'm sure to get between now and the end of the holiday season um, from someone who wants to buy a bee hotel and wants to know my opinion. So I'm gonna ask you the expert, your opinion of, uh, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but maybe you could give us a nice elevator speech for those people who know that we're bee fans and have questions about whether they should do this. Sure. So, um, I mean, the first step is uh, understanding that a uh, bee hotel supports bees and wasps, right? And wasps are great, right? These solitary wasps are involved in pest control from aphids and uh, uh, caterpillars that defoliate our, our crops and so forth, um, but also provide this important, um, you know, uh, maintenance of hyperabundant insects and environments, right? So bee hotels, support wasps too, that's the first thing. The second is that not all cavity nesting bees use bee hotels, right? And in fact, it's mostly a subset of bees that include those that will nest in gregarious conditions, uh, you know, on horizontal planes and uh, use, uh, be more flexible in the materials that they, they use. And, you know, as you start to create these conditions, inevitably what you're getting are species that are more common more abundant in the landscape using these as a, you know, more nesting opportunities. You know, the important thing we don't know is how much nesting opportunities there are in a five by five meter area, right? It's very hard to put your mind in the mind of a bee and try to envision that or figure that out. And so on one hand, bee hotels are great because it creates nesting opportunities. The question then becomes what's nesting in them? And our, our work in cities definitely find that more non-native bees are represented. About half, half bees are native, half are non. But if you set up a bee hotel, I mean, I saw some of the regions that some of the speakers uh, here or some of the listeners are, are, are tuning in from, in more rural environments, um, you're gonna get a lot more native bees um, because there simply isn't the amount of non-native bees in a lot of those places. We definitely find in cities or in more urban areas, higher proportion of non-native bees th than in rural or non-urban areas. So that's something else to consider. And the last thing I'll say is of course, bee hotels are educational and you can learn a lot from them. You can get up close and see, you saw the video I showed, seeing the bees work. And in terms of engaging with these like amazing phenomenal creatures, uh, bee hotels are fantastic for doing that. Um, there are other things like, oh, parasites might get in and so on. There are resources out there for maintaining them. And I would encourage people to check those out. One really great one is called Managing Alternative Pollinators. It's a free book. Uh, if you just type in Managing Alternative Pollinators PDF, you'll find it. Um, and there are some great bee researchers uh, and uh, advocates that, that put that together. Great, thanks. So uh, a question way at the top of the list has to do with the uh, artificial cavity nest and um, maybe your perspective on the best time of year to clean them and like our, who's overwintering in them, who are you gonna disturb? 
Yeah, that's that is a tricky thing. Um, the the idea of cleaning them when do you do it? Um, uh, bees, of course, some depending on when you set it out, uh, you may have captured bees that are active in the early spring, like mason bees, all the way through to the summer. Bees that are active in those time periods, like leafcutter bees. Um, so there's never the right time to clean it because there's always bees leaving or entering. Uh, and so you don't want to jam a, a pipe cleaner in there or something and, 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 and crush a bee or, or hurt one. And so my best advice usually is uh, a bee hotel designs that you can remove and put back clean uh, tubes. In wood designs, you can get paper inserts. Our lab uses cardboard tubes, which may not be so easy to acquire. Like we have to bulk buy a whole bunch of them, but there are many designs out there where you can have inserts. And so if you know there's something in there, you can remove it and put it in a, uh, you know, a, 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 a brown paper bag or something, uh, keeping it protected from the elements and then letting it uh, emerge naturally uh, in the spring. So, uh, I tend to not want to jam things down these tubes. Uh, I would rather replace, but inevitably uh, as uh, use accumulates through time, uh, the scent of a lot of these uh, uh, bees and wasps and so on can attract parasites. And so I, all I would say is if you don't have a design like that, I would maybe replace it every few years. Okay, so Peter asked, Peter is an aspiring uh, landscape architect, and he wonders how much are biologists, conservationists, and like-minded architect and planning professionals involved in infrastructure creation? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, uh, I'm sure in Ontario, there are similarities across many of the U.S. states, too, in terms of developers making a lot of the decisions for us all, right, in a lot of contexts in the dense urban core. But I do think that there is an increasing awareness of the need to engage stakeholders um, in even uh, you know, uh, uh, institutional or commercial type zoning or, and uh, certainly residential ones. One strategy that's really helped us in Toronto is the Toronto Green Standard. So it's really on the backs of the municipality, at least in our city, um, and maybe there's a statewide organization in some of the states you're in, I'm not sure. but. Um, creating a, a green standard that is the minimum expectation of developers to integrate into their planning creates a space for ecologists, landscape architects, and so forth to be brought into projects, right? So, uh, for example, a new uh, engineering building is being built at a local campus, and it has to adhere to the Toronto Green Standard, and that means it has to have these different green elements and it can be very good uh, for a developer who's bidding on a project to be able to say, oh, we have an ecologist on our team, or we are working with landscape architects who know, have a vision of how this works and can do that site inventory and the pre and post occupancy of biodiversity and things like that. So I would encourage you to look at what um, policy and minimum expectations there are on developers in your city or your region and maybe start there to see where you where you fit in. Also speaking to landscape architects who, who work in this world um, can be really great. And that's how I got my start is I, I just started talking to landscape architects when I moved to Toronto. And I said, I love green roofs, I love bees. Like uh, what's going on here? Oh, we just passed a greener bylaw, perfect timing. Um, so yeah, I'd encourage you to check at what your the, the city or the region expectations are. Great, thanks. Uh, do you worry about creating habitat in cities that it will create a general sink for wildlife populations over time? That's a really good question. I mean, um, I am more of like a glass half full type of person and I wouldn't think about the potential negative things when we are all obviously at like alarm bell moment for biodiversity conservation, city planning, climate change, adaptation to, mitigation of, and so on, right? Um, I'm very much a, a, a try, a don't, don't try, do, right? So get out there and try and do it and learn from it and adapt to it. So um, yes, I think that there are instances where city design can act as a habitat sink, but there, I believe that there are more examples of the opposite. <laughs> 
Great. I really appreciate your positive perspective. It's a, a breath of fresh air when there's a lot of um, ominous news out there. Oh um, let's end with um, uh, some of your thoughts on ways to enhance community gardens. I know you've looked at community gardens as well, maybe just some ideas and tips for getting habitat uh, baked into community garden spaces. I, that's a great question. And I mean, an interesting thing is a lot of the plants grown in community gardens aren't necessarily pollinator dependent, right? Carrots and kale and things like that. Um, and, however, of course, pollinators play an important role in seed set. And so uh, thinking about the perpetuation of community gardens, um, seed sharing, we have CD Saturdays in Toronto where everyone shares seeds and you know, you go to the library and there's this like, box of seeds there and everything. Growing seeds that are locally adapted to our environment, um, uh, are free or publicly available, um, and promote the creation of you know, heirloom seed sharing and so on. I really feel like seeds are a real opportunity to bake in the value of pollinators, um, especially when we think about the context of food security. The other element that we are really interested in in Toronto is culturally appropriate foods. And uh, I mean, when you, if, if you could take a, a day and walk from the center of the city to the Rouge Park, um, and we've, we haven't done this, we took a car, but like we identify all the crops in the community gardens as you go further and further outside the city and there's turnover, right? It goes from more Mediterranean, European herbs and so forth as you go further into more Asian, African types of crops. And we actually don't know a lot about the pollination systems of those in a novel environment like a city of Toronto. And so we often argue that uh, to support culturally appropriate food production, we need biodiversity, bee diversity, simply because we don't know what the best fits and matches are just yet. So, I mean, there's that element too. And I mean, community gardens are place-making opportunities, right? Uh, people go there. Um, day and night, meetings, pizza oven, whatever, and, uh, uh, you know, centering um, non-food producing flowering plants and trees and shrubs in those environments too can be a really effective way to support pollinators as well. Great, thanks, Scott. Thanks so much. I, I hope you've been able to look in the chat box. Lots of thank yous and um, kudos for all the good work that you're doing. Really appreciate your time with us this morning. Oh, yeah.